go ahead and, and bow for prayer. Let's ask for God's help as we open up his truth together. And let's specifically pray that we'd be more grateful after this message than we were before this message because of what we learn about God's character. So let's, let's go ahead and pray together. Father, when we look to you and we focus on you, we find so much joy, so much satisfaction. And we look at life and we look at cir- circumstances in life, we could often become frustrated. And we also confess that sometimes we let circumstances overwhelm us. At times we let the stuff of life consume our hearts, consume our thinking and our responses. And so I pray that you'd help us to allow the word of Christ to dwell in us richly. We pray for minds that are quick to submit to your word, and I pray you'd give us a hunger today, a thirst for you, and in response to that, may you find in us a heart that is sincerely, truly grateful for who you are. You are a good God, you're a great God, you're so faithful to us, and I pray that you'd find us living life in light of that great truth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said together. Back before the internet, some of us remember life before the internet. Uh, I think those of you in the youth group, you've never lived life without the internet. I find that fascinating. That's, that's hard to believe. But life before the internet, before blogs and online forums and, and um, people debating online on social media... In the old days, when you debated someone, you had to do it out in the open, in front of everybody. And, and they called them open-air debates. And many years ago, there was a, a pastor who I never met because he died in the 1800s, but he's had a, a big impact on my life. His name is J.C. Ryle. Some of you might recognize that name a little bit. Um, we quote him a lot here at Calvary. He tells the story of this atheist, this infidel, he called him, who was before this large, sizable crowd, trying to convince people to become an atheist. And he was teaching to them, there's no God. He said, there's no devil, there's no heaven, there's no hell, there's no resurrection, there's no judgment, there's no life to come. And he encouraged them, throw away your Bibles, get rid of your Bibles. Don't listen to your pastors, don't pay any attention to what the Bible says, And he recommended that they think like he thinks. And like like many of these types of speakers, he was very bold. He was very persuasive. And he was winning the crowd over to himself. And in the middle of his lecture, there was an elderly, weak, feeble lady who went from the back of the crowd and worked her way to the front. And she tried to get the man's attention. She didn't have a strong voice, and she tried to get the man's attention, and finally, the man heard her, and he listened to her question, and she asked this one simple question. Sir, sir, with all the voice she could muster up, sir, are you a happy man? Are you happy? Are you a happy man? And the man stood there shocked. He's usually not asked questions like that. He's like, well, that's not why we're here today. That's not the point of this discussion. Let's move on to what my lecture is all about. She asked the question again. Sir, are you happy? Are you a happy man? The atheist looked annoyed. He gave her no answer. And she said, I ask you to answer my question. Are you a happy man? Are you sincerely happy? You see, you're encouraging me to throw away my Bible. You're encouraging me to abandon Christianity, to not believe in in the death of Jesus and his resurrection from the dead. And you advise me to do this, and before I do that, before I take your advice, I want to know what good I shall get from it. So I ask you today, do you believe that what you believe gives you comfort and hope and joy and encouragement? Does what you believe really make you happy? Are you yourself truly a happy person? This elderly lady asked this well-known atheist. So the atheist stopped. He attempted to answer her question. He hem-hawed. He stammered. He stuttered. He simply could not answer 
the question, and finally he said this. You know what? I'm not going to answer the question. I didn't come here to talk about happiness. I came here to encourage you to not believe in God. But the woman stuck to her point, and she insisted her question be answered. And what happened to the atheist man? He got frustrated, stormed off the stage, and here was an elderly woman who won the day because she asked a question that somebody who rejects Christ cannot honestly answer. Are you happy? Are you happy? So I'm going to ask the question today. What do you learn from this story? I think you learn this. Apart from God, and by God I mean the, the true and living God of the Bible, the God of Scripture, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as God is revealed in Scripture, and, and God tells us there's only one God. There's only one true and living God who you read about in the Bible. And I would propose this to you today. Apart from him, you will not know what joy is. You will not know what contentment is. You will not know what being blessed means, which is the biblical word for being happy. And you would also be completely foreign to this idea. What does it mean to be truly thankful? You will never understand that apart from a relationship with Christ. So let's ask the question to us today. I don't, I don't think I'm talking to any atheist today. I, I might be. I'd love to talk to you after the service and show you from the Bible how you can come to know God's love and his grace and his mercy. But I'd ask you today, the vast majority of you would profess at least that you know Christ as your Savior. So I'd ask you this. Are you truly today a joyful person? Are you joyful? If someone were to ask you, are you really thankful today? Are you truly a joyful, thankful, happy, grateful individual? How would you answer that? Or better yet, I'd ask you this, why should you be thankful? Why should you be a grateful person? The 100th Psalm answers this beautifully for us. So I'd invite you to take your Bible. Let's look at these five verses today together in the 100th Psalm. If you're using your pew Bible, that's page number 500 in your pew Bible. Go ahead and grab that and see me after the service. I'd be happy to, to get you your own Bible. We have lots of them here. You'll note at the beginning of this psalm, it says this in the subheading, a psalm for giving thanks. Something interesting about that. It's the only psalm that has that setting. And it says here that if you're going to be a grateful person, if you're truly going to express a heart of gratitude, there's something that has to go on in your heart. There's something you have to understand. Better yet, there's someone you have to know personally, and you have to know something about God. And this psalm contains here really the, the, the examination of a heart of somebody who's truly grateful. Seven imperatives we're going to unpack from this, and this is what you're going to demonstrate to others. More than just saying, I'm thankful today. More than just saying, I'm glad God has done X, Y, and Z for me. We're going to be able to look and see what is truly the heart of a thankful person. What does that person's heart look like? And here's what you're going to understand from this passage. Thankfulness really is more about your understanding of God than it is your circumstances, what's going on around you. Thankfulness really isn't about your circumstances in life. What gets you down in the dumps? What discourages you? What gets you disillusioned about life? That's really not the source of thankfulness. Thankfulness, friends, is really your understanding of who God is. Do you truly understand the character of God? So this is why we're going to start today in verse 5. Something different we're going to do today that I normally don't do. We're going to start with verse 5 and then work our way back in the psalm and start again with verse 1. And this is the reason I want to do this. I want to examine today what is the real motive for being a thankful person. Why should we be thankful. So if you're asked the question today, why are you thankful? Why are you happy? There's a multitude of verses you could give, but this is a great place to start. And I'm going to make this proposal to you today. Can we make an agreement? I think everyone here, not in the same time frame, but I think every individual here could memorize Psalm 100. How many of you actually believe that? 5% of the church believes that. And I'm going to try to convince you otherwise by the end of the message. I really believe you can memorize this. Five simple verses 
that'll keep us from looking at life and thinking, this is why I should be down, this is why I shouldn't be thankful, this is why I should be discontent, and this is going bad in my life. And then I look back at this, specifically verse 5. Three things about God, if I'm constantly keeping this in front of me, the Lord is good, the Lord is loving, the Lord is faithful, I'm not going to be an ungrateful person. I will truly, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18, I will be giving thanks in everything. Because that is the will of God in Christ Jesus for me. To give thanks in everything. I walk in the office here, and I'm thankful that I see this on on Sarah Campbell's desk. Give thanks. I walk in our living room, and I see on one of the shelves, give thanks. Can we say those words together? Give thanks. Now, what I want to do in the next two and a half hours, I want to give you an encouragement here as to why you should do that. Why should you do that? And I want to propose this to you today, friend. You have a very good reason to do that. As a follower of Jesus, somebody who believes the truth about the Lord and what he says about himself, the fact he died and rose again on your behalf, you have very good, substantial reason to give thanks to God today and to always be giving thanks to him. So why should you give thanks? You should give thanks, friend, number one, because God is worthy and God is good. God is worthy because God is good. Let's look at verse 5 together. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Something I've learned the hard way about the gods of this world and the idols of this world, they're not good. They're not good. Money's a terrible god. Earthly pleasure's a terrible god. It's a terrible idol. See, the thing about an idol that, that we struggle with, we looked a little bit at this today in, in ABF. In Psalm 115, it talks about these idols. Isaiah 44, it, it, God, in, in almost a sarcastic tone, talks about these idols. The problem with an idol is you never know when it's going to fail you. But I can tell you this, it will. You never know when an idol is going to fail you. But I can tell you most assuredly, it will. Whether it be money, whether it be the approval of others, possessions, employment, physical pleasure. Here's, here's what these idols are like. They're like a ticking time bomb. And one of these days, without you expecting it, they're going to explode. And they're going to crush you. Because you've heard me say this before. Life is not just hard. Life can be crushing. Right, friends? It's not just hard. Life can be downright crushing. But it's not like that with God. You see, God is good, not just because of what he does for us, but because that is his character. Psalm 34, verse 8, let's read this together. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Let's read that again one more time, and if you could, I got a bad allergy struggle that I have this morning, so my voice isn't as strong as normal. When we read that again, when we get to good, can you elevate your voice a little bit? Think we can do that? Let's do that together. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. I like the way A.W. Tozer defines the goodness of God. A little book called The Knowledge of the Holy. We have it in our bookstore. Uh, You'd be really wise to get your hands on this. But listen to how he defines this. What do you mean when you say God is good? Well, it's more than a cliche. The goodness of God is that which disposes him to be kind and cordial and benevolent and full of goodwill toward men. Think about the goodness of God for a moment. In Genesis 1, verse 31, when God created everything and he saw it, he saw that it was, help me here, friends, good. Right now in my life, with everything that's going on, and everyone here would probably say, you got a lot going on in your life, and you do. But with all of it, We can emphatically say this, that God is working all things together for, help me here, good. The psalmist recognized in Psalm 119 verse 68 that God, when he afflicts me, God is, can you help me here? He's good. And God is not good simply because he does good things. God is good because that's who he is. He is a good and he's a gracious God. And Look, friends, if we're not convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt, 100% convinced that God is good, we're going to have a really difficult time being thankful people. 
If I'm thinking in my mind, God owes me more, I deserve better, I should have more than what I've got right now, I will not be thankful. And what we have to understand is my circumstances change. My life changes. But the goodness of God, when will that ever change, friend? Never. It will never change. Theologian Andrew Wilson is is helpful with this. He explains this nicely. I want you to listen to this because... He explains the goodness of God in such a a succinct way. I've never really heard it explained this way before. Listen carefully to this. In the same way, God is good by definition. And anywhere you find goodness, you will by definition have God and vice versa. You can't have God without goodness and you can't have goodness without God. This is the teaching of the whole of Scripture. Everything God made was very good, Genesis 1, verse 31. No one is good except God, Mark 10, verse 18. All things work together for good to those who love God, Romans 8, verse 28. Those who seek Yahweh lack no good thing, Psalm 34, verse 10. And these two attributes of God are tied to his goodness that you find in this verse. God's love and God's faithfulness. Notice again in verse 5, the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures for how long? Forever. Forever and ever and ever. This is the the Hebrew word hesed love. You've heard me say this before. It's his covenant, his faithful love to his people. And in his love, here's what God does for us. He cares for us. He nourishes us. He provides for us. He protects us. And in love, God sent his son Jesus to die as a sacrifice for our sins. Thankfully, God doesn't love me today based on my character or my performance. God doesn't love me more today because I had my devotions this morning. God doesn't love me because I'm preaching today. God doesn't love me because I'm a pastor. And God doesn't love you, thankfully, based on your performance. God loves you because that's who he is. That's his character. God is love, 1 John 4 teaches us. And his love is tied to his character. So that means, according to this verse, his love is everlasting. There'll never be a time where God tells you, never, you'll never hear this from God, I don't love you anymore. He'll never say that to you. And then we also find this, that his goodness is tied to his love and is tied to his faithfulness. Notice here, and his faithfulness to all generations. So what God was for Abraham and what God was for Moses and what God was for Joseph and Jacob and Isaac and Daniel and David and what God was for the disciples in the early church and what God was and is for your parents or your grandparents, that's who God is for me. He'll always be faithful. There'll never be a time in our lives where we could ever say God is not faithful. Your full expectation of God should be, God will always be faithful. So what's going to keep us today from murmuring, from complaining, from being ungrateful for what we have? What will keep us from being frustrated as life changes? Think of all the changes in life. It could be you've gone from a house full of children, now you're an empty nester. As you struggle with changes to employment, and and employment isn't what it used to be, and maybe you make a different amount of money now than you used to make, and as you change with different seasons of life where your body changes, and life's not as easy as it used to be, this is the one reason why you should always be thankful in every circumstance, because God is good, and God is loving, and God is faithful. Together, let's say this. God is good, God is loving, and God is faithful. We're going to say this a few times. What's going to keep me from complaining in bad traffic? What's going to keep me from complaining in financially lean times? God is good, and God is faithful. Or God is good, God is loving, and God is faithful. Be nice if I knew my own sermon, right? God is good, and God is loving, and God is faithful. So verse 5 is really the reason you can live out verses 1 through 4, is you understand the character of God. If I'm looking at my character again, I get discouraged, I get down, I can get depressed. Now we're going to look at three characteristics of a truly thankful person. If if you're grateful today and you're thankful, 
This will be the characteristic of your life. So why should we, as children of God today, why? Why should you be thankful? And what we're going to look at today in verses 1 through 2 is because God is worthy of your joyful worship. Look at verse 1 with me, if you would. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. So the psalmist here lays out three specific ways how you can show heartfelt worship to the Lord. And the first one is this. It's to joyfully shout. Joyfully shout to the Lord. The Hebrew word for shout gives the idea of an army coming back victorious from the battle. And as they come back, they're shouting the praises of the king and saying, we won. They're letting the king know. Or when people would see the king, they'd say, here's our king. And we're joyful that our king is there. And they're shouting for joy. And a good way to understand this shout is to think of God's people gladly joyfully singing praise to him because they're happy or delighted in him. Who is this command given to? Oh, I know, it's given to those with bubbly personalities, right? Who is this command given to? Oh, it's given to those who are naturally inclined to this. It says here, all the earth, which teaches me God wanted Gentiles to be saved, not just the Jews. God wanted all the earth to know about him. Let me ask you a hard question today. What or who are you most excited about? What gets you excited? What should you be most excited about today? Should we be more excited about the Lord than we are about our possessions? Than we are about our hobbies? Or even this, here's a deep gulp. Should we be more excited about the Lord even, than, even more than we are about our sports teams? <laughs> yes, absolutely. There should be this joyfulness, this joyful, triumphant annunciation, and, uh, this joyful announcement, our God reigns. Our God is king. Here's the second thing as we humbly serve him, is that you gladly serve. Notice the commands here in verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness. Notice there's not just one command there in that short little sentence. There's two. We're to serve the Lord, but we're also to serve the Lord with gladness. So let me ask you two questions today. Do you serve? Do you serve the Lord? And then on top of it, here's something else God tells us to do. Do you serve the Lord with gladness? Now, why and how can you serve with gladness? gladness. Again, go down to verse 5. There's the truth of verse 5. God is good, God is loving, and God is faithful. Because we all know how it is, more than likely. When you serve someone who's self-serving, if you serve someone who's dishonest, if you serve someone who's greedy, it's very difficult to serve someone like that. Wouldn't you agree with that? But when you serve someone who is perfect, who's good, who's loving, and who's faithful. Friends, there ought to be a great joy in our hearts when we do that. There ought to be this wonderful joy in our hearts. No matter what he commands us to do, we can do that with gladness, and we can do that with joy. Think with me for a moment. In every context, God may have you serving. That means you can serve with gladness as you serve children, as you serve in the nursery, it means you can serve with gladness when you pray and nobody else sees you and only God sees you. And Matthew 6 talks about this. When we pray, we're not to sound the trumpet. We're not to try to bring attention to ourselves. When you pray and you're interceding for God's people and no one else sees you, it means you serve with gladness as you sing in the choir or you play an instrument in the orchestra. It means you do that with gladness. It means you serve with gladness when nobody says thank you to you. And it seems like you get no appreciation, you get no accolades, and nobody notices what you do, but yet you still serve with gladness. Why? Not because people are always good, but because God is good, and God is loving, and God is faithful, and God is worthy of our praise because he is good. We can serve with gladness because we understand we serve a great God who is our ultimate 
source of joy. Ministry is a wonderful thing, friends. Wouldn't trade it for the world. It's great. It's a wonderful privilege being in ministry, but ministry is a terrible source of joy. Never allow your church or ministry to be your source of joy. That always has to come from a personal relationship with God. Serve him with gladness because he, God, God alone is your source of joy. Here's another thing he tells you to do in verse 2. Come into his presence with singing. The immediate context of this would have been the Jews coming into Jerusalem, going into the temple to worship. This means that when we sing, this is something that happens here. When we sing, it's not an offering so much to the person next to us. When you sing out to the Lord, it's an offering of praise as unto him, to him, our good, loving, and our faithful God. So that means when I sing in church, and when you sing in church, we're not singing for a Grammy Award. Because I don't think anyone here is going to win one. doesn't mean you can't win one. I'm just going to make a prediction. We probably will not win one. We don't sing here to get a gold record. We don't sing here to be known for our eloquence. We sing joyfully to our great God as an offering of sacrifice, as an offering of praise, because our God is good and he's loving and he's faithful. That's why we sing. We don't sing because we have a good voice per se, and if you do, praise God for that. That's wonderful. Wish I had that myself, but we sing because God is good. Not the quality of our voice, but the character of our God. That's what makes our singing a sacrifice of praise to him. Number three is this. Why? Why should you be thankful? Because God alone is worthy of your joyful submission. Your joyful submission. Look with me at verse three, if you would. No. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he, it's God who made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Notice something carefully in verse 3. What's the first word in verse 3? Help me here. Know. Know something. You know what God wants from our worship? He wants it to be intelligible. He wants it uh, to be to have knowledge. He wants our worship of him to be knowledgeable or intelligent. We should know the one that we're thanking. We should know about him. We should know his character, his promises, his word. How has God changed us? What exactly is God doing in my life right now? What does it mean to be God's child? And you find all of that in his word. In Acts chapter 17, verse 23, the Greeks worshipped the unknown God. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is knowable. There's a lot of things about God we don't know and and things we're we're not going to be able to understand. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29 makes that clear. Those secret things belong to the Lord. But there's an abundance of things we can know about God. You can know his grace, and you can know his forgiveness, and you can know his salvation, you can know his faithfulness. In other words, our God is knowable. He's knowable because Jesus has died and has risen again from the dead to bring us in a relationship with him. We can know who God is. There's a lot of people, and I would dare say this, the vast majority of your Facebook friends you probably do not know personally. But God, we can know personally. We can know him in a very deep, personal way. Jesus said this, and this is eternal life. What exactly is eternal life? That they may know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So according to this verse, what should we know about God? First thing is this, he is your creator. Notice what it says, it is he who made us and we are his. This teaches me something. You are designed, you are created, now you're sustained. This is the reason blood flows through our veins. It's the reason we have air to breathe and our bodies function and work properly when we go to sleep at night. It's because we're created and he sustains his creation. And what this does, friends, it gives your life meaning. It gives your life purpose. We are not a biological, cosmic accident. We're created in the image of God. And what that means, you have a sense of eternity, you have a sense of morality, you have a sense of direction. You were created, and you were created for a purpose, and that purpose is to glorify your creator. But he's also this, if you're saved today, if you truly know Christ, 
He's also your redeemer. Note the phrase here, and we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. If you cannot think of one reason to thank God today, and I don't think anybody here would be in that predicament, but let's say you're saying today, I cannot think of one solitary reason to praise God. Think of this, friend. God is your creator, and if you're saved today, and I trust most of you are, and if you're not, you can leave here today forgiven by God through his Son. God is your creator, and he is your redeemer. That means you are his sheep. You belong to him. Notice the words of Jesus in John 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Most of you, if not all of you, will go through the death of a loved one. And there's that temporary separation you have. It's difficult, and it's trying, and it's sad. And at that moment, what will encourage you are those words, we are his. Can we say that together? We are his. Life, to be brutally honest, is full of disappointments. You're going to have disappointments professionally with work. You're going to have disappointments relationally with people. There's going to be disappointments from time to time financially in life. Things will not always work out. And when those inevitable disappointments come, because God says those things are going to happen, we have to remember those three words. We are his. Again, together. We are his. Bad health may come in Whenever I go to a nursing home, it's, it's often that I hear from individuals, I never planned on being in this position. I never planned on that. I never planned on being unhealthy like this. I never planned on life changing this much. And bad health may come. And when bad health comes, you can remember those three words together. We are his. One of the saddest places that I've been to personally was an orphanage in Haiti, several orphanages, several years ago. Pastor Predison, whose picture is out on the wall in the, in the hallway, would take me to, to these different orphanages, and he would introduce me to each child, and he knew the story of each of these children. And it seems like each and every one of them had a very sad story. One of them, he said, the, the mother tried to sell the daughter into prostitution. And the orf orphanage was able to bring her to that orphanage. Another one, several of them, the story was simply this. The parents just left the kids there, just left them there. No nice goodbye, no going away party, just completely left them there, never to see their mom and dad again. What a sad and tragic story. And then I think back to this verse, as a child of God, God will never do that to his sheep. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never abandon you. Through every facet of life, in every area you enter into to life, and every trial you go through, his presence will always be there. We are his sheep, the sheep of his pasture, and he is our God. We're his people. That means this. You'll always be loved. You'll always be cared for. If you're in Christ today, you will never be forsaken. I'm with you, God teaches us, always, even into the end of the age. Fourth thing is this, why should you be thankful? Because God is worthy of your heartfelt praise. Look at verse 4, if you would. Enter his gates with, what kind of heart attitude here, friends? Thanksgiving. And his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Three imperatives in this verse. One small verse, three commands. Enter, give thanks, bless his name. Enter, give thanks, bless his name. The original emphasis here were the Jews gathering in the temple, and God wanted them to praise his name together, to show everybody else in the world they're different. They have a reason to be grateful. They have a great God who they're giving praise to. And many times in Scripture, especially in the Psalms, which... I heard somebody say one time, the Psalms are you know, like the soundtrack of the Bible. Over and over again, we're commanded to praise God. And that means when we really want to, and that also means when we're down in the dumps. We're to praise him. We're to give him praise. We're to do this privately. 
Maybe when you're driving in your car, your personal quiet time, we personally give praise to him, and then we do it publicly. When we gather together with God's people, that's the emphasis of this verse. When God drew you out of the world and he drew you to himself, he didn't do that in isolation. God did something great in your life. He drew you from the powers of darkness and he drew you to himself. Now you're his. But he also did something else. He placed you in a family, the family of God, the universal church, which is the church of all time, Christians from every time and every, every century, that's the universal church, but then he also put you in a visible church, a local church, a family. How many of you know even in a family there's problems? And every church family has warts, and every church family has sin we're dealing with, And no family's perfect, but it is the family God puts you in. And in this family, something beautiful happens. We come together, we we come to the word, and we learn the word together, we grow together. Sometimes we fail together, we fall short. And Christians from time to time have to ask each other for forgiveness. We have to help each other grow in Christ, and our weaknesses become very visible. But this doesn't happen in isolation. This happens as we live life together. And as we live life together, what God wants us to do, God wants us to praise his name together. One way of showing God's worthiness is when we gather together and publicly give praise to his name. We prepare for a lot of things. I'm always amazed when I do a wedding, and let's say it's 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'll try to get here in good season, and I'll come to my office, and I'll see people walking by, and, and it's, it's about noon or so, an hour or so before the wedding, and, and I'll ask, hey, did you just get here? How, how long have you been here? Oh, we've been here since like six in the morning doing our hair. I mean, six hours doing your hair? How can you do that? Think of how much time is put into preparing for a wedding, a 30-minute ceremony. We prepare for, for surgery. We prepare Thanksgiving meals that take sometimes days, usually hours to prepare. I don't know how it is in your house, but we're in our neck of the woods, it's about 15 minutes that thing's inhaled and it's gone. And it's like the dish came out of the dishwasher. We prepare our homes for guests. And, and many times somebody says, hey, you mind if we come over? I'll sometimes say, do you mind if you give me an hour or so to clean up a little bit? So, you, you know, things can be presentable. And we prepare for a lot of things. We prepare our hair. Believe it or not, I spent two hours on my hair this morning. Anybody here believe that? (laughs) Curling iron, coloring, blow drying, all that stuff. We prepare before we go out in public. We iron our clothes. We do our laundry. We fix ourselves up. But can I give you a loving challenge here, friends? And this, I think, will help us get the most we possibly can out of this time together in church. Can I ask you how much you prepare your heart before you gather together with God's people on a Sunday morning, maybe a Sunday night, or the Wednesday night discipleship groups? How do you prepare your hearts? And there's a lot of ways you can do this. By praying for your own heart. And it's easy in a a setting like this to think, this is exactly what so-and-so needs. And yet, forget our own heart. God, reveal things in my life, reveal idols in my heart, reveal areas where I don't want to grow, reveal where I'm stubborn and prideful and I'm not submitted to you. Praying for the message, praying for your brothers and sisters in Christ. There's many here, they're discouraged and they're going through a difficult time. And pray that God would give you an opportunity to speak words of encouragement to somebody else here as we gather on a Sunday morning. Another way is to, to prepare your heart is to simply give thanks to God. We have a place to gather for worship. Are you thankful for that, friends? And we have liberty and we have freedom, and the government right now is not interfering with, with what is being preached. We have the liberty to do that. Maybe pray that God would be pleased with our worship. Not that we would be pleased, but that God would be pleased. And our praise should have a focus. That focus is on who God is, and what God has done, and what God has promised to do in the future. That's the focus of our praise. Not a musical genre, not how long the service lasts, not the way everybody else is dressed, but it has to be focused on God. 
We can praise God. Why? Because, why, friends? Three things. God is good, and God is loving, and God is faithful. Can we say that again? God is good, and God is loving, and God is faithful. What's the expiration date on that? It's never going to change. That's true yesterday, today, and forever. So if the elderly woman came to you and asked you today, friend, are you happy? Are you truly joyful? Why are you joyful today? I'm not joyful today because everything in life works great. I'm not joyful today because my sports teams always win. Although it has helped a little bit in the past month. But I'm not joyful today because of that. I'm not joyful today because I have a lot of food to eat. That's not why I'm joyful. I'm joyful today. If I'm ever joyful, it's because of God. It's because God is good. And God loves me despite who I am. And God will always be faithful. Because, friend, thankfulness is more about who God is than it is about the circumstances you find yourself in. There's always a reason, earthly speaking, to maybe murmur or complain about your circumstances. We never, never, never have a reason to complain about God. Because God is always good, he's always loving, and he's always faithful. Would you bow with me in prayer as we come before his presence? And let's thank him for this privilege and opportunity. Father, thank you so much that you are good and loving and faithful. I pray we'd think about that more. I pray we'd meditate on that. And in the pressure points of life where we're tempted to be discontent or murmur and complain, please draw our hearts back to that truth, to what this psalm teaches. We can do all of those things, serve, serve with gladness, shout for joy, enter your courts with thanksgiving. We can do all of that because you are good and loving and faithful. Thank you that in your faithfulness, you saved us. In your love, you sent your son to die for us. And in your goodness, Father, we can enjoy you forever. Bless these dear people, your sheep, who you sent your son to die for. May you be glorified in our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said together, amen. Let's stand.